Okay. Okay, I goofed. I forgot to change my screen over. I was presenting a whole bunch of information and all that's gone, so I have to start over. But that's okay. So, a long time ago, I had an idea for... Well, I had some concerns about when I die, what I would leave with the world. What kind of an impact will my life have had on the planet once I'm gone. So I thought about what I could do to try to make the world a better place. So um, I, that got me thinking about things like why is there suffering? Why is there crime? Why are why do bad things happen? Things like that. And so I, I was looking at this question of why does crime exist? Oh, so I forgot to switch my screen over again. So I was looking at the reason for why does crime exist? And it says the causes of crime are complex. Poverty, parental neglect, low self-esteem, alcohol and drug abuse can be connected to why people break the law. Some are at greater risk of becoming offenders because of the circumstances into which they are born. Now, I thought about all these things, and the only thing that I think I could make a difference on would be poverty. And I was like, well, why is there poverty? And then that got me to the topic of scarcity. Now, scarcity is a concept of not enough resources and too many wants. Um, scarcity refers to the gap between limited resources and theoretical limitless wants. The notion of scarcity is there's never enough of something to satisfy all conceivable human wants, even at advanced states of human technology. So I was like, well, why do, why do people steal cars? Why do people steal things? Well, it's easier to steal it than it is to try to go through other means to get it. It's the, it's the shortest path. You know, in computer science, there's a thing called the shortest path where it's like, what's, it's, and it's, it's used in delivering packages because it's like this route, where we are right now to this house, what's the shortest path to get there? What's the easiest path? Because it's the quickest. So that got me thinking about scarcity and how we could turn because the opposite of scarcity is abundance i mean if if you could walk up to a machine and say give me 10 tvs there'd be no need to steal tvs because you'd have 10 tvs and your neighbor would have walked up to the machine and got 10 tvs everybody would walk up to the machine and get 10 tvs at that point tvs are worthless I mean, that's why nobody goes outside and steals handfuls of dirt because dirt's worthless because dirt's everywhere. Everyone has dirt. That's why it doesn't have any value. So, trying to think about how to prevent crime to make a positive influence on the world had me thinking about the issue of scarcity and how we could make enough resources for everyone. So thinking about that, I watched Star Trek and in Star Trek there's a device called Replicator and basically it's hooked in to this vast source of electricity or energy and it's able to produce anything you want. Now, I assumed that when I when I, I thought about this device, I was thinking it was using the matter antimatter energy to mass relationship and it was directly converting energy into mass. And then when you recycle your drink after you're done drinking it, it would convert the mass back into energy. That's not the case. Here, this article talks about how it's more like a universal assembler. Like it just gets the, the atoms or compounds or molecules and assembles them into the right order. I was thinking it literally did the energy conversion too. But if you did have a machine that could do both, like it could convert raw energy into mass and then assemble the mass into the correct pattern, You'd basically have a replicator and you could walk up to it and you could say, give me 10 TVs. 
and everybody could say, give me 10 TVs. And if you have a source of energy as vast enough, that would be doable. And then TVs would be worthless and everyone would have 10 TVs. And there's no point in stealing TVs. So you've gotten rid of that crime of theft because no one would need to steal anything anymore because there's abundance for everyone. So thinking about this, the, the, the way it gets its energy is they use a matter antimatter explosion basically, which is relates to the mass energy equivalence equation e equals mc squared, which is if you talk to an actual person in physics, they're going to say that's not the real formula. That's just the simplified common everyday person formula. There's more to it than just that. I'm not a physicist, but I'm aware of this, where it basically equates energy and matter. And so, but this is, we don't have anti, well, we can make small particles of antimatter on earth, but it's too expensive to do anything with them. So this is sort of an infeasible way of, of, of going about this. But we can do it because this, this article over here, Synthesis of Precious Metals on Wikipedia, it's possible. Um, there is an artificial production of gold. Uh, such a transmutation, transmutation is possible in particle accelerators or nuclear reactors, although the production cost is currently many times the market price of gold. So, uh, uh, since there's only one stable isotope of gold, nuclear reactions must create this isotope in order to produce usable gold. So it's so expensive, the, the resources are so scarce that it's not worth going through the process. But the process does exist. If we had an infinite well of energy, everything could be lined in gold. There would be, you could have gold everywhere. And that would make gold worthless because then it would be over the whole planet. So this got me thinking, well, this process does exist. We can literally create atoms. And if you can create atoms, there's got to be a way to create molecules from those atoms and compounds from those molecules all the way up to a guitar or a cup of tea or a plate of food. You know, that we don't currently have the technology all together in one little box that just says, give me a TV and it spits out a TV. But on paper, it's possible. In theory, it's possible. Or excuse me, in hypoth hypothetically, it's possible. The, the process exists. We just don't do it because it's not cost effective the amount of energy you have to shove in there to get out one gold atom, it's just not worth it. So the real root problem is the scarcity of energy. That's the real problem of the planet. So looking at energy, we're all familiar with, um, the different forms of energy that we normally come across fossil fuels uh, nuclear fuel uh, renewable energy we're all familiar uh, with these different forms of energy like with fossil fuels petroleum you know gasoline diesel coal natural gas we're all familiar that but but this burns carbon puts carbon dioxide in the, the air uh, which is great for plants, but not so good for us. Um, and it puts other pollutants in the air too. So, I mean, it has its upsides and its downsides. Now there's renewable energy, uh, uh, solar photovoltaics. There's um, uh, wind power, hydropower, solar cells, geothermal, and bioenergy. But the prob problem with these guys is if the wind stops blowing, you don't get wind power. If the rain stops falling, the dam dries up, there's no, no water to push the hydroelectric generators in the hydroelectric plant, you don't get electricity. 
if the sun, if it's a cloudy day and the sun stops shining, you don't get solar energy. So there's an off switch to, to some of these technologies. <clears throat> Geothermal energy, I mean, you're drawing heat out of the earth and you're using it to spin a turbine, but then you have to have a cooling source because you have to have a temperature differential. So you've got the very hot water coming out of the earth. You have to have a cooled source, but then when you run that cooled water, well, you're just going to dump that into a river somewhere. So you are warming the oceans. That's not good for the planet either. I mean, if we ran the whole world off of geothermal energy plants, we'd eventually be boiling the oceans. I mean, over a long span of time, I'm not saying it would just be like the next day. Of course not. So <clears throat> in bioenergy, um, I don't, honestly, I don't know enough about it to actually speak about it. It's making alcohols and you burn the alcohol just like gasoline. I, you, you, there's, there's still going to be a, 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 a waste cycle there. I mean, because you have to harvest the stuff and then convert it into alcohol and that it's going to produce some waste compost or whatever. And then so you get your fuel, but then you burn the fuel and then it puts pollutants in the air. So, I mean, everything has its downside. So I was looking at these different energy sources and then I started thinking about outer space because in satellites, uh, especially like Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, uh, those guys have an electric generator, a, ra a isotope, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, and it uses an array of thermocouples, which a thermocouple is just two different metals of wire stuck together, and when there's a temperature difference, it creates a current. So the thermocouple, the, 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 the fuel is spitting off radioactive particles, which is generating heat. The thermocouple converts a temperature differential between the fuel and I'm guessing the outside or a ground or something a difference temperature and it uses those two different temperatures to can create electricity which powers the sensors and a little computer and all that stuff so and these are great but like Voyager 1 and 2 eventually that fuel is going to run out there's an off switch when the fuel's gone the heat source dies, the current flow in the thermocouple dies, the computer dies. And that got me thinking about like in outer space, like uh, with, uh, um, you know, all the new e Elon Musk and all that sort of stuff is if you're in outer space and let's do some little, little dots here. So, oh. Okay, so if you're in outer space and you're trying to travel from point A, uh, to point B, okay. So if you're trying, trying to travel between these two, well, if you're using, what made me think about this is if you're using solar power only, there's going to be a midway point in here I'll just put it here there's going to be a midway point where your solar cells are going to be super weak from either side so if you're trying to use like a solar power source and the uh, or what are those plasma ion engines? Like if you, if you had a, a solar array large enough to power plasma ion engine, which uh, charges particles and, and then shoots them out, out of the, the end, so you get positive thrust. Uh, if you're halfway between two stars, like if you're doing some intergalactic travel, uh, solar cells, you, you're not going to get anywhere. It's going to take forever to get any energy because the light levels would be so low. 
And so solar cells are a bad choice in this particular instance. I mean, you would, so you'd start out from this star, traveling to this star, so you'd have to go solar, 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 and then switch over to nuclear, and then switch back to solar, and then, then you'd be where you're at. Or another choice. So I started looking into uh, solar cells and how efficient they were. And I looked at, uh, okay, on this website, uh, here's this little chart that says the percentage of sunlight the solar cells are getting. Okay, so there's ultraviolet, violet, blue, green, all these different colors are in different wavelengths, and that's the nanometer stuff. So, like, if you uh, buy one of those illegal laser pointers online um, that you can shoot your eye out with, uh, like the, the green lasers or whatever, it operates in this range of, of the spectrum. And I remember going through school, and the electromagnetic spectrum is much larger than this, significantly larger than this. And that got me thinking. So if you go over to the electromagnetic spectrum article uh, and you pull up this chart, that little band right there is the visible light. That's all that solar cells, well, I take that back. It's not all. Here it says infrared and ultraviolet. So, okay, so ultraviolet's here and infrared here. So there's a band in here. This is This little area is what the solar cell's using. And there's all this other stuff out here that it's not using. And so I'm like, why don't we make solar cells, but not solar? You know, make, make a device that receives every single wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum. Use all the energy. I mean, we're literally living, if you, if you go outside the Van Allen radiation belt of Earth, uh, there's there's research being done right now at, at NASA and JPL and big science universities where they're trying to figure out how can we keep astronauts alive longer? If we put uh, people on Mars, how can we keep them alive because of uh, solar radiation and background cosmic radiation and things that are damaging to human cells? Because you have ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing non-ionizing radiation won't necessarily hurt you. Ionizing radiation destroys your DNA. I mean, it can, it's, it's the high energy stuff, the x-rays and the gamma rays and stuff, and enough of it will knock little pieces off of your DNA. And then when the cell goes to replicate, there's a failure and then you get cancer. That's a summary. I mean, that's not the full picture, but I mean, more or less, it's basically what happens. Eventually, it will catch up with you. So that was my original concept was, why don't we make a solar cell that works off of everything, collect the entire electromagnetic spectrum? So, um, so I wrote a paper in 2008, and I started off with the principle that uh, the creation of uh, a conservation of energy. The conservation of energy states that energy is not created, but merely changes form. You can't create energy, you can't destroy energy. It just changes from one form to another. Now, if we go back to our little chart over here, most of it gets converted to heat infrared. Or, well, excuse me, thermal infrared. Wherever the heat is on this, and heat's bad. He's, heat's waste because we can't figure out how to convert heat into something useful. And it's just heat energy. That's why you ha cars have to have radiators and, and because they have to throw off this excess heat because you have to have a, a temperature differential. you got to get the heat of the explosion away from where the explosion is so the next explosion can occur. Otherwise, you damage the engine. Uh, a nuclear reactor, you got to get the heat away from the rods to so you 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 have the steam turn the turbine but the only way to make the turbine spin is you got to have a temperature differential you have to have a cold side to it so what do they do is they collect water out of a river and they heat up the river water 
from the the energy of the reaction with the therm the the nuclear reactor and then that pours out of the nuclear reactor back into the river so you're heating up the river killing the fish and things like that i mean not it's not instant but several degrees can affect an ecology now don't get me wrong a lot of these technologies are good they've ser served us for a long time but we really need to think about how much heat we're spitting out I mean, people wonder why the temperature of the earth is going up so far. I'm not so sure it is all the CO2 stuff. It might be a combination of CO2 gases plus heat. Everybody has a car. All the roads are uh, covered in asphalt, which converts visible light into infrared heat that it reflects back. All roofs uh, are covered in um, uh uh, ceiling tiles and black tar roofs and all this sort of stuff and it's absorbing the energy and converting it into heat and just throwing it off into the atmosphere and we wonder why the planet's heating up it's because every square inch is covered in asphalt and every house is covered in a, a, a dark roof it's it's not just the co2 it's the co2 and the heat So, heat engines are slowly going to cook us. So, if we could figure out a way to convert all this energy into something useful, that would benefit us. So, since energy can't be created nor destroyed, only changing form, we need to figure out a way to change the forms of the stuff that we can get into something that's useful. Now, background radiation. If, if we're considering, if for a moment we, we're not thinking about the Earth strictly, if you go off into space, think of, think of Mars. Mars has a very uh, low gravity, a very low magnetic field, uh, the moon is even worse as far as gravity and magnetic field, I believe. Um, and so it's not like the Earth, where the Earth has this bubble around it protecting us from being cooked to death by the sun's radiation and background cosmic radiation. Uh, that's why it's so dangerous to go to Mars is because you can you literally be cooked from the inside out because of the radiation. Uh, not all at once, over time. But, but the basic principle is, is if you think about this for a moment, we're living in a sea of energy outside of the Van Allen radiation belt. The universe is a sea of energy. It's just in forms that aren't useful for us. Um, Natural background radiation comes from two primary sources, cosmic radiation and terrestrial sources. Now this is sort of talking about that. Uh, cosmic radiation, the earth and all living things on it are constantly bombarded by radiation from outer space. This radiation primarily consists of positively charged ions from protons to iron nuclei derived from the sun and other sources outside our solar system. This radiation interacts with atoms in the atmosphere to create secondary radiation, including x-rays, muons, protons, alpha particles, pions, electrons, and neutrons, da, 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 da. And so it's basically saying that our geomagnetic field is what's protecting life on the planet. So if we want to leave the planet, we have to either recreate that effect or figure out some way to convert that ionizing radiation into a more useful form. Um, and then I think I talk about yeah, then I talk about power as far as orders of magnitude, where we talk about how um, in particular, this is an example of cosmic microwave background radiation, a nearly uniform glow that fills the sky in the microwave part of the spectrum. Stars, galaxies, and other objects of interest in radio astronomy stand out against this background. Uh, note, a terrestrial source, okay, so we're talking about Earth, 
for example, might include a radio station. Notice how many thousands of watts of power are just floating away from us like ripples in a pond. So if we look right here, uh, this amount of watts. Now, when I printed this off and when I wrote this in 2008, the article said 10 kilowatts to 50 kilowatts for an AM channel. It didn't have the scientific notation here. Um, and then I had another entry here for 50 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts, which is the highest allowed ERP of an FM band or radio station. So the energy is just floating off into space and we're, we're not collecting it. We're not converting it into a useful form. You're just wasting the energy. Sure, I mean, you get to hear your radio stations, but we could also use the other space on the planet to collect the power and use it. Uh, the next point I want to make is uh, all energy is nothing more than photons. Uh, quote, because electromagnetic radiation can be conceptualized as a stream of photons, radiant energy can be viewed as an energy carried by these photons. Alternatively, EM radiation can be viewed as an electromagnetic wave which carries energy in its oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So the photon itself doesn't have any energy. It's the, the field, the oscillation, the change of the field that is the energy. Same way as as the the a wave in the ocean, the the ocean, the water itself doesn't have any energy. It's the wave that has the energy. Um. Uh, also, uh, electromagnetic radiation, also called light, even though it all is not always visible, is a self-propagating wave in space with electric and magnetic components. These components oscillate at right angles to each other and to the direction of propagation and are in phase with each other. Electromagnetic radiation is classified into two types according to the frequency of the wave. So that's where we get the radio waves, the microwaves, the terahertz radiation, infrared, visible light, all that sort of stuff. So the, and, and if we went back to here, that's how we get the different pieces of this spectrum. And the solar cell is only getting a small part of this. So it's like, most of the energy is in this high frequency stuff. Why aren't we having a gamma solar cell? Why don't we have a gamma solar cell? Well, there's a reason for that and I'll get to it in a second. All right, so where was I? Radiant energy. Okay, so. All right, so now we get to uh, electromagnetic radiation, and this is, oh yeah, and this is talking about how the energy is in the wave itself, not in the particle thingy. Uh, photoelectric effect is a, uh, oh yeah, we're going to, okay, so, so this is where the energy is. We just need to convert it into a form that's useful. So the photoelectric effect, uh, photon striking a wire, conductor of electricity, causes an electron flow. So the photoelectric effect is a quantum electric phenomenon in which electrons are emitted from matter after the absorption of energy from electromagnetic radiation such as x-rays or visible light. So that's how our solar cell works. Light strikes it, that impact causes a flow of energy in the wire. Um, but it doesn't actually create the energy. It, I don't, I don't know the right way to say it. It's like billiard balls, one billiard ball striking another one. So the first billiard ball stops and the energy is converted from the, the particle that hit the wire. And now the wire has an electron flow because it's the second billiard ball basically. Um, when a metallic surface is exposed to electromagnetic radiation above a certain threshold frequency, which is specific to the surface of the material, the photons are absorbed and current is produced. No electrons are emitted for radiation with a frequency below that of the given threshold because the electrons are unable to gain sufficient energy to overcome the electrostatic barrier presented by the termination of the crystal surface. 
Um, by the law of conservation of energy, the electron absorbs the energy of the photon, and if sufficient, the electron can escape the material with a finite kinetic energy. A single photon can only eject a single electron because the energy of one photon can only be absorbed by one electron. So, that's a solar cell, but we don't want a solar cell that only absorbs regular solar cell wavelengths. We want all the wavelengths. Give us all the energy. Okay, and now we sort of go off in left field. Okay, antennas. Antennas transmit and receive alternating current radiant energy. So the photoelectric effect is an ocean type ebb and flow effect on the electrons in the conductor. Okay, so, so with the transmitter, you're sending electricity through the wire to generate electromagnetic waves. And in antenna, the electromagnetic waves interfere with the antenna, causing an electron flow within the antenna. Uh, more specifically, the, uh, the um, what was it called, the skin? skin effect. The skin effect is the electrons basically flow on the outside of the wire. They don't actually flow through the, the middle, more or less, roughly. Um, uh, physically, an antenna is an arrangement of conductors that generate a radiating electromagnetic field in response to an applied alternating voltage and the associated alternating electric current or can be placed in electromagnetic field so that the field will induce an alternating current in the antenna and a voltage between its terminals. So that's what we want. We want an antenna that, that picks up every single wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum so that we can convert it into an electron flow. Now, I think that's impossible for you to have one antenna to do all of that, but I don't see how it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility to have multiple antennas, an array of antennas to receive, to be tuned to every single frequency or a massive number of antennas tuned to a massive range of frequencies. So if we go back over here to our, our little guy, wherever it was, over here. Yeah, so we go back over here to our little guy. So basically, the high the high energy stuff like this stuff and I don't know, microwaves I don't know what whatever we want we could create an array of antennas that could be tuned to these frequencies to pick these guys up that's what we need instead of just saying oh well ho hum let's just stick with solar cells because it's a proven known technology no let's do something better let's improve i mean the world's in a upside down place right now as it is let's kick it in the butt and do something important so um all right okay so so the key point to this is antennas are interfered with a piece of wire is interfered with by the photoelectric effect and it creates an alternating current in the wire. Okay, now Nikola Tesla patented a radiant energy device over here. Um, can I make this bigger? Oh, I guess I can't. Uh, anyway, anyway, he patented. Uh, it hasn't been useful. I don't know if it's useful to anybody. It may be just cited left and right, but um, uh, but it's just really a, a curiosity, the, the way he set it up. Um, but notice that the energy he focused on was alternating current. Uh, the patent number is US685957, and I think this is... Uh, a image. I don't know how that works. Uh, Nikola Tesla described the photoelectric effect in 1901. He described such radiation as vibrations of either small wavelengths, which ionize the atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. He didn't know what he was talking about, but he got the effect to work. Um, 
uh, he described uh, uh, describes radiation charging and discharging conductors by radiant energy. Tesla used this effect to charge a capacitor with energy by means of a conductive plate. The radiant energy threw off with great velocity minute particles, electrons, which are strongly electrified. The patent specified that the radiation or radiant energy included many different forms. These devices have been referred to as photoelectric alternating current stepper motors. Um, so basically he has a plate up here electromagnetic radiation radiant electromagnetic energy energy everywhere or energy available through our atmosphere strikes a plate bumps the electrons causing a flow which he had charge a capacitor which would then the difference between the ground charges and the charges that came in would give you a current flow basically um, all right, now we got to take a little detour. Uh, oh, there's the full, okay, there's the full size thing. My bad. Anyway, um, it's probably been quoted, but I doubt anybody's actually really used a whole lot of it. So now we go on a little detour. Voltage and current amps are two, diff two separate things. A typical DC motor requires both voltage and current. So let's get this out of the way first. Okay, a volt. In the hydraulic analogy, sometimes used to explain electric circuits by comparing them, comparing them to water-filled pipes, voltage is likened to water pressure. It determines how fast the electrons will travel through the circuit. Current, in amperes, is the same analogy as a measure of the volume of water that flows past a given point. So there are two different completely measures. However, you have to have both to make modern, regular DC motors turn. Um, quote, the DC motor can be thought of as a transducer which changes voltage and current into speed and torque. That is, electrical power into mechanical power. The DC motor, the current controls the force or the torque, and the voltage tends to control the speed. This is because of the basic relations of force equals a current times a magnetic field and voltage equals a constant times the time rate of the cutting magnetic flux. So for all of our modern technology you have to have volts and current to make the motor spin. So that's not going to work. We, you can't just, that's why you can't just have a long wire and a, and a capacitor which is basically how I started doing. I have a folder here. I have a folder here where I did nothing but a bunch of tests. Like if, this is nothing but a bunch of, of tests right here of numbers of things I tried. And basically it was different lengths of wire and different capacitors because you can take a, you can take two feet of wire and a capacitor and connect one side of the capacitor to the antenna and the other side of the capacitor to go around and come back in five, 10 minutes. And there will be a voltage difference on the capacitor. You didn't do anything to make that voltage difference. It was just radiant energy striking the antenna wire, causing electron flow. And that's how you get free voltage basically. But the energy in that form is useless because our modern DC motors can't use it because there's no current. There's no, what did it say? Flow. Um, because there's no measure of the volume of water that flows past a given point. That, that part doesn't exist. You have, you have the flow of electrons but they're just collecting in the capacitor. So I was like, okay, well that's, that's not good. And so I did some more research and I found what's called an electrostatic motor. An electrostatic motor is a type of motor based on the attraction and repulsion of electric charges. Now a very good example of this is Benjamin Franklin's electrostatic motor. Basically you have, you could have a positive on one side 
and a negative on the other, and the charges are moved from one side to the other by the glass thimbles on this bearing hub rod thing. Now you could very easily place that one side with a ground and the other side with a hot coming in from an antenna and a capacitor and and if the voltage was high enough the motor would spin and I've read on several websites that you can they, they make uh, electrostatic motors out of um, soda bottles the plastic soda bottles and you can power it with an electric uh, fly swatter the kind that you you stick to your cousin and he screams because it shocks him I'm joking I don't do that that's a joke but the, the little electric flash water, you can power. I've seen videos online of a guy who hooked electric flash water to an electrostatic motor and the voltage was high enough, it made it spin. So this motor does not require a current. It only requires a difference in charges, a difference in the, it just requires high voltages. And it moves the voltage, the charges from one side to the other. That's basically how it works. And so that I was like, okay, this might be possible. And then I discovered see, voltage multipliers. And voltage multipliers, what they do is it's a series of capacitors and diodes, and it basically, uh, it's uh, you, uh, voltage multipliers can be used to generate a few volts for electronic appliances to millions of volts for purposes such as high energy physics experiments and lightning light, lightning safety testing. Most common type of voltage multiplier is a halfway series multiplier also called the Villiard cascade um, but basically this is what makes um, a lot of stuff work like there's uh, a lot of these circuits in um, copy machines for the high voltages to make the toner work there's a lot of these I think they're in um, uh, fluorescent lighting I think that's right uh, there are and then, like they say, there's also in uh, other computer components like energy, physics, high energy physics experiments and things like that. Um, I know that they're used because this is a Cockcroft Walton generator. Uh, it's, it's basically a voltage multiplier, but it's used for performing the first artificial nuclear disintegration in history. Whoever knew about that? We can disintegrate things. Well, if we can disintegrate them, Maybe we can also put them together, thus solving the scarcity abundance issue. So, um, so voltage multipliers. I don't think anybody has ever thought about having arrays of antennas piped into uh, 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 voltage multipliers to pump up the high voltage since you don't need a current. And then use the high voltage from that, put it all into a, um, uh, uh, what's it called? The, um, a Leyden jar. I don't have a picture of that. Yeah, I don't have a picture of that up. Uh, yeah, a Leyden jar, um, which is used for uh, uh, high voltage experiments, basically. But basically, it's like a little capacitor battery kind of thing. Uh, it just has two different charges, one on the outside and one on the inside. Um, I don't know how possible it is to store high voltages. I don't know anything about that. So I don't know if you can store them for a long amount of time. I, I doubt it. I imagine they would bleed off. But basically, if you had an array of antennas and an array of voltage multipliers that was bringing in more energy that could then that energy that could bleed off or that powered the um, electrostatic motor you basically have and and I've labeled it an electric static engine um, which I think is a new form of uh, energy a new energy source basically uh, um, so getting back to my paper uh, Tesla's radiant energy device is too weak to produce a voltage and current amps required to power a typical DC motor. However, we can get higher voltages if we use a voltage multiplier circuit, but the current amps will be virtually non-existent. And then I go through and talk about the voltage multipliers. Um, da, 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 da. And then 
Thus, our antenna and voltage multiplier combination will only produce high voltage. This will be insufficient to power the typical DC electromagnetic motor. However, if our voltage multiplier has a sufficiently large number of stages, it could power a different type of motor called electrostatic motor. This motor will readily run off of high voltages with zero current amps because it uses the potential differences of charges between the high voltage source and an earth ground. It's basically a water wheel. You know a water wheel like a, a, a mill? Yeah, like these guys. Yeah, it's basic. It's basically like this for charges. You have you have a high source on one side and a low source on the other side. So you've got you've got your high charges and your ground. Um, so it's basically a water wheel for static charges, for static electricity, and that uses the uh, that will use the renewable energy of cosmic and terrestrial radiation sources. Um, and I, I thought, I was like, oh, this is amazing. I've got this great idea. Um, I've got to try to share it with everybody. Um, and then, I, okay, so here I talk a little bit more about the electrostatic motor. Let's skip that. That's kind of boring. I mean, you basically, you've got it. You got the gist of it. I mean, it's basically, it, like I said, it's a water wheel of charges. It moves and spins because there's a difference of charges. Um, however, there's a downside to this, and the downside is um, here. Okay, so if you look at the art, uh, the Wikipedia article about the electromagnetic spectrum, there's a picture here, and the picture is uh, uh, where's the text? Go back to the text. A plot of Earth's at atmospheric opacity to various wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. This is to the is, this is the surface to space opacity. The atmosphere is transparent to long wave radio transmissions within the troposphere, not opaque as shown on the chart. So if we go over here, um, basically what it's saying is like visible light is let through, radio waves are let through, but everything else is blocked basically. It's to keep us alive. I mean, the, the, the Van Allen radiation belt, the the electromagnetic bubble surrounding the earth that's powered by the core, the magnetic field of the core of the earth. All of these things work together to block this dangerous radiation, this dangerous ionizing radiation to keep from cooking all life on the earth because the sun would just boil us and there wouldn't be anybody left. There wouldn't be any creatures left. It would just kill everything. Um, so those, so the bad ones are blocked, basically. Um, so this energy source that I've been discussing, it wouldn't work too well on Earth. Uh, I, I'm not an engine. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not a physicist. I'm just a hobbyist. I'm just a creative person, and I like to think about things, and I like to. I I don't know the math behind it, but I understand the concepts. I think I understand the concepts. And I may have stated some things wrong. And if I do, I apologize. I sincerely apologize. If I've said anything wrong, I'm sorry. And I will I readily accept correction. However, if this actually does help somebody, if it actually does improve life for one person, it's worth it. So I don't think this would work very well on Earth. It might work. I don't know. We have a lot of radio stations pumping out a lot of, 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 of um, uh, EM radiation. Everybody has Wi-Fi now. There's going to be 5G. There's all we're putting all these signals into the atmosphere. Why don't we have converters to convert that back into useful energy? It just seems like that would be something we'd want to do. Now, okay, given this might not work very well on Earth, it would work great in space. It would work great on Mars. You wouldn't be able to stop these things. These, this machine would run 24-7, 365, or however long a Martian day is. I don't remember. I think it's longer. 
it, it would work amazing in space, work amazing on Mars. I mean, just imagine a satellite with a power source that converted all electromagnetic radiation into high voltage, pumped it up through voltage multipliers, and then ran that through a electrostatic engine or, 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 or electro, electrostatic motor um, to a ground. Now you you have grounds exist in space. The space the space shuttles had a ground. I know they had a ground. Um, uh, electrical. If nothing else, you could have just a little bucket of dirt that you take with you, and there's your ground. Um, uh, oh, don't no, I don't know how to find it, but I know it exists electrically on their diagrams. I know that there is a ground, so I know that I know that from high charges to a low ground, you have that difference, and that's the same thing I was talking about with the all the heat engines with the with the nuclear reactors you have to have you have to have the hot water and the cold water and you run it through a turbine and that spins a turbine and gives you electricity the problem is is the cold water coming out isn't cold anymore it's warmer may not be hot but is warmer than it was you can't just keep running that same water through the system so you have to dump it somewhere you have to dump it out in a river or, or a, a collecting pond or something. But if you do that, the warmth, the heat that's in that water, will the water will evaporate. And so that heat goes in the atmosphere. So it, you're either warming the atmosphere or you're warming the rivers and lakes and things. And, and so heat engines are going to heat up the planet. High levels of CO2, asphalt, all, all the roads that we have, the, the ground, every square inch of the ground is covered in a dead gum road. All the roofs are covered in, in dark black tar, uh, what is it called? To not tiles. Anyway, um, whatever roof is covered in, you know what I'm talking about. And it's absorbing all the light and converting it into infrared. So, and all that infrared has nowhere to go except the atmosphere. So we're just heating up the planet for no good reason. This takes high voltage charges and brings them to an electrical ground, which is a low voltage charge. Now the gr a ground in your house, in anybody's house, the electrical ground is just a rod sticking in the dirt. So any bucket of dirt can be an electrical ground because it's it's just dirt. It's, it's an insulator. It doesn't absorb electricity that good. So if you have high voltage on one end and you've got an insulator on another that doesn't accept charges very good, there's your ground. There's your difference in charges. That's how you make the electrostatic motor work. But now you put the whole thing together, the array of antennas, the arrays of um, voltage multipliers going to a, a Leyden jars that collect all these charges and then deliver them to an electrostatic motor. And the electrostatic motor is either geared down because it has to run very fast or I don't know how that part's going to work. I'm not a mechanical engineer. But it could then turn an electrical generator that charges a regular DC battery. So now you've converted high voltage to ground into a spinning rotor that charges a, a regular DC generator to a regular battery. And I've got, I've got that right here. Oh, I've got that right here. So electrostatic engine, you have your antennas arrays that collects the cosmic EM radiation energy through the photoelectric effect. And you either have them tuned to different frequencies or the same frequencies. I don't know. Basically, you create an electromagnetic black hole. You want to absorb all electromagnetic radiation that 
goes into voltage multipliers that pumps that up into high voltage as high as possible now yes I know voltage multipliers if you look deep in the documentation after a certain point you can't keep adding stages uh, each part of this circuit is called a stage and the, and it's they talk about how the voltage will sag past a certain point but still ton of antennas a ton of these guys correctly see I, I don't know how many circuit stages they need I don't know how many voltage multipliers should be in a bank of these things I'm not an electrical engineer I need an electrical engineer to figure this out but once he figures out the he once he or she excuse me once he or she electrical engineer figures out the correct number of stages and the correct wiring of this stuff then that would go and charge a super super capacitor leading jar or whatever just a storage place for the charges so you gather the high voltage maintain levels that will continue to run the electrostatic motor you have that power the electrostatic motor so you've got a difference between the ground and this high side so it's spinning and so you put a gearbox on that thing and you put a, a generator on it and you convert that motion into a stored DC charge so now you have the regular current that everybody knows and uses from radiant energy again it wouldn't work too well on earth but it would work great on Mars it would work great in space it would work great in interstellar space where you're between two stars and you didn't bring enough nuclear fuel with you or you're in between two stars and the light levels are so low that no matter what way you turn the solar cells they don't generate a charge if they do it's meh minimal this is powered by all of the 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 the, the, the gamma bursts of uh, neutron stars it's powered by all the x-rays thrown off by black holes it's powered by the entire universe all of the wasted radiant energy of the universe and there's no cloudy day to stop it there's uh, no a lack of wind to stop it this thing works 24 7 365 or whatever time scale you're looking at it constantly works there's no off switch it's constantly charging it's constantly running it's constantly producing usable electrical power given that it has to be correctly tweaked and balanced and set up and and that it would work best in space or not earth basically okay now a while ago I said create an EM black hole that's another thing if you had a wall of these guys so if you had if you had let's do so if you had one here and one here and one here and one here no, I can't I'm not I'm not an artist okay so if all of these are radiant energy circuits so I'm going to do a let's do a do green so all of these are radiant energy circuits and, and let's assume this is three-dimensional you just created a space on the inside that has less ionizing radiation so if you have multiple layers of these guys in like a base you created a safe space a habitable habitable zone that's free of ionizing radiation or either the probability of it would be really low I mean you have to calculate how many layers of these guys you'd need to make a wall in order to be able to do this but you could effectively create a safe zone in a dangerous deadly ionizing radiation space kind of thing I mean this is basically a get out of jail free card for people wanting to get off the earth 
I mean, you'd have to have, I don't, I have no idea how many of these circuits you would need, but, but you've just converted all of this useless, deadly radiation into usable power, usable energy. I mean, I just, then you can use that energy for mining, for creating structures, for uh, using the resources on, say, Mars to create items from, you know, you could, you can take the, any ores that you find and smelt them and make things with it. I mean, it, it, it gives you the power, the energy to do whatever you need, to do whatever work you need done. And it, and in conjunction, uh, if, if it was set up into a habitat kind of a thing where you, let's say, I don't know, let's, let's say you had to have 10 of these guys to make it safe. So there's, let me, uh, give me a line. So let's go, well, I can't do 10. So let's do, let's do four lines. So if you had four lines of these guys, and that was what made this inside part safe. Uh -oh. And you get, you kind of see what I'm getting at. And then I'll do the same thing down here. Okay, so now, so let's say four is the magic number that you have to have four layers of all these circuits and they're all powering um, storage batteries and you stored all this electricity, you can use it to run uh, ventilation systems. You could use the power to run a cooling and heating system. You could use the power to run computers. You could use the power to, it's basically a power source for anything that you want. And it's keeping you safe. It's giving you a liv livable habitat. Now, obviously, you'd want a door somewhere. You'd want to um, give me a thing. You'd have to have some sort of a electrical airlock or something that would let you, you know, come in. Why is that doing that thing? Yeah, you'd have to have like an electrical airlock or something to get in and out. I don't know how that would work. But basically with enough layers of these things, you would have a safe space to work and live in. And these guys are making you power to use for whatever you want. So electromagnetic black hole, that's what you would want in the middle. You don't want any bad ionizing radiation because you want all the astronauts or, or what are they calling them? Mar, Mar, Marzonauts? Marsians, I don't know. You want all the people to live and to, to keep doing their work and their scientific research and all that sort of stuff. Because think about it. You can't really do science experiments on Mars because the radiation would kill whatever creatures you're experimenting on. Like if you're doing like the little worm experiments or whatever, they're going to be dead. Radiation's eventually going to kill them or either mutate them and make them where they're no longer valid test subjects. So you have to address this radiation issue. So why not take something that's deadly and make it useful? So anyway, that that's that's my that's my concept. Cuz I don't think anybody's put this combination of things together before. At least not that I've seen. So um so doesn't necessarily work on Earth. I think it would work fantastic in space. And I think it'd work pretty good on Mars. Um, I mean, and we've, cause we've had ideas before about uh, space-based solar power where it's just a satellite in space and it just beams the energy back to earth. And we just sit here and we're just like, oh, cool. You know, we're getting more energy from the sun cause that's what it's doing. It's converting the solar energy and storing in batteries and then beaming it to us somehow. And then we convert it back into an, a usable form. So it's all about conversion of the energy and how much waste is included in that conversion. Um, and that's really what I wanted to talk about. Um, I don't even know if anybody's watching. I doubt it. But 
and if I cursed or something, I'm sorry. I'm just, I've, I've sent this idea to so many places that I could. I talked to one guy and he accepted it, but I don't, I don't think he really knew what I was talking about or tr what I was trying to talk about. I sent it to uh, a second person and, uh, he seemed really cool. He knew what I was talking about, but I haven't heard back from him. Um, I, I've, you can't, you cannot get anybody's email address from NASA. There's no, the Department of Energy, NASA, JPL, no matter what you do, they don't accept uh, non-solicited ideas or proposals. I mean, you basically have to have a company and a team of people and it doesn't matter if your concept is correct or not. They won't even look at it. They won't even hear you out. So I'm putting this on the internet because I've got this great, I think it's a great idea. You know, it, at least not for earth power generation. It's a great idea for Mars. It's a great idea for s space. I mean, can you imagine the, uh, what's the space ion engine? I forget what it's called. Ion thruster. Yeah. So here, Okay, so you put a scoop on the front of your space shuttle. So as you go through space, you're collecting cosmic gases, cosmic dust, cosmic particles or whatever. Okay, you have this system, the electrostatic engine in the middle of the craft and he's got antennas and he's collecting all this EM radiation and he's bumping it up to a, a high voltage and he's spinning that electrostatic motor and he's creating uh, power, he's creating charges. And then you have that guy just crammed right into the end of this thruster and it, and you charge those gases and eject them out the end and you've got infinite thrust. I mean, basically free infinite thrust. Because that's what that's 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 all you need to have this. You have to have matter to be ionized, and then something to ionize it. And I don't know what how these guys. I think I think these folks are using electricity. I don't know if it's coming from batteries. Probably it's coming from a nuclear pack. Uh, the the thermoelectric thingy I showed earlier probably coming from something silly like that. Either that or um, space hack relying on chemical rockets to initially reach orbit. I don't know. I, I don't know. But I know when you're out in space, I just think this would, this, this energy generation system would work so well with satellites, interstellar spacecraft like I said before when your solar cells and you're in between two different stars you're if you're exactly equal between them you're not going to get much out of those solar cells they're basically dead weight um, um, and I know all of this is possible I'm not oh great phone call Hang on just a second. Okay, so I know all this is possible because uh, there's a video on YouTube that I watched. Um, it was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, there's somebody on the phone uh, I don't know why they had to call right now. It's not like I'm not trying to do something important. <clears throat> okay, so I know all of this is possible because there's a video out here on a, a guy named Laser Saber. Uh, he has a video called Free Atmospheric Electricity Power Small Motor. And it's a very small motor. Now he does use a drone to bring an antenna up into the atmosphere. So I'll admit he's using electricity to hold the wire up. However, if you actually had a static 300 foot tall antenna or however tall he goes with his drone, uh, you'd get the same charges 
constantly without the expenditure of energy of the drone. Um, and basically, he throws a wire up in the air and it spins a tiny little motor. He's getting charges and he's bringing the high voltage to the motor and the motor, the electrostatic motor, has a difference between the high voltage and the ground. So the motor spins. Now it doesn't really do anything useful. I mean, we want a motor that does something useful, but this, pro this video proves the principle. I mean, how much more energy would he have generated if he had had the voltage multipliers in the Leiden jar? Because the Leiden jar is basically going to kind of sort of act like a capacitor and sort of um, average out the charges that are coming in. So if you have an array of antennas, array of voltage multipliers, and the antennas are not being, like in the video, he has the drone hold the wire. I mean, you'd have to have a static antenna. But you'd want the, the antennas tuned to the frequencies that you want. So you, so you need an electrical engineer to figure out, uh, well, you, first off, you need a wireless engineer to figure out the, um, well, you need a physicist in here somewhere too to find the most efficient use of this technology. So like the frequency to uh, antenna, chemical makeup of the antenna relationship, that's one issue. Then you need another engineer or the same engineer um, to figure out the uh, um, uh, voltage multiplier, the number of stages, uh, what components, what they should be rated at, um, how to get the most out of the system, and then how many of those do you need to make a bank of voltage multipliers, and then like if you're actually on Mars, how many sets of those guys you'd have to either bring with you or make on the planet to convert bad, deathly, killing, ionizing radiation into usable power by spinning an electrostatic motor or multiple electrostatic motors. Um, that would be the, that would be the optimal. So that's, that's the concept. And I don't know if anybody's uh, in the chat but I'm more than happy to talk about any comments or questions you have. Um, so uh, anyway, um, that's my idea, that's my concept, and I wanted to try to get this monstrosity of a thing together somehow in one coherent package because I'm not a, I'm not a very good writer. I don't, I don't think I am. I'm not a physicist. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm just a hobbyist. Okay. I'm an enthusiast. And I found something and I, like Lego, I plugged it together in the right way and it looks to me like it would work. I mean, it literally looks to me like it would work. I just don't know how many of these you need, how tall they need to be, what they need to be made of. I don't know how many of these you need. I don't know how many stages there needs to be in each one. Uh, I don't. I don't know the relationship between the antennas and the voltage multipliers. Uh, I don't, because you remember you want to use all available electromagnetic radiation. You want to convert all of it into electron flow, and get the highest voltages possible, and then shove all that stuff through the Leyden jar into the. Uh, electrostatic motor and get usable energy out of it, usable power, so that it can actually do work. Um, and like I say, I, it, it, it probably won't work very well on Earth. I mean, you might be able to get a demo working, maybe, uh, a very simple, low level, because the, I read, I don't know if I can find it now, one thing said if you go up 10,000 feet, no, you go up three, for every 300 feet, you get 10,000 volts, something like that in the atmosphere. That's why there's lightning because you go up so high and there's such a difference in charges between the, the cloud, the particles in the clouds and the ground. That's why there's lightning is a difference of charges. So 
while this might not work on Earth very well, I definitely think it will work in space. Definitely. Because you don't have the Van Allen radiation belt preventing the bad radiation from getting in. And astronauts need, astronauts, Marsonauts, whatever they're being called, uh, they need that, they don't need that bad radiation. So why don't we convert that bad radiation into something that not only gives them a habitable area to work and live in, but also powers everything. I think that's super cool. Anyway, that's, that's my thought on the whole subject and I've talked an hour and 15 minutes. And so that's that, that's this little, I'm just doing a mini stream. I'm not really gonna do a, a gameplay or anything like that tonight. I just wanted to sort of get this hypothesis down. Um, so my hypothesis is, I believe it's possible to let the universe and all its radiant energy work for us by using voltage multipliers to power electrostatic motors. That motion can then be converted into whatever useful form we need. Um, so, I know, good grief. So that's the idea and um, that's it for the stream. Uh, everybody have a good night. And uh, one, I hope I didn't offend anybody. Two, if I'm wrong, I apologize. And I don't know how to issue a correction over a video. Uh, three, nobody in chat has said anything. There's no comments uh, uh, regarding the material that I've presented today. So I'm gonna call this video because I'm gonna archive this off of Twitter. Off Oh, not off Twitter, off of Twitch onto YouTube, and that's going to be my electrostatic engine video. So, so that's that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, you guys uh, have a great day. And uh, I hope one day this might help somebody. That'd be really cool if it helps at least one person. You know, maybe this would be a technology that actually could be used on Mars. That would be awesome. I don't want, this is public domain. I don't want any money. I don't, some recognition would be nice, you know, uh, but I don't want any money for it. Um, Cause too many people try to invent something and then hold their cards to their chest because it's like, oh, I, if I tell you the secret, then you'll make money off of it and I won't. Well. I'd rather this help the world, humanity. So it's public domain, anybody can use this if you find it useful. Uh, it may not be useful, I don't know. Maybe this is already known. I, I've searched and searched and searched and I can't find this combination of components put together in this fashion. So that's, that's, my, that's my concept, that's my creative hypothesis for a new energy source called the electrostatic engine uh, yeah that's it that's everything so later